I want to talk today about the paradox of next. I want to talk to you today about the paradox of next. I want to speak to you from the book of John, the gospel according to John, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 14. This will be part one of two. And it reads quite simply this. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called a twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said unto them, children, many fish, he answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find something. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciples whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. Hmm. They're able to see him. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself in the sea. The other disciples came in the, in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place. With fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon, Peter, went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This idea of the next thing has permeated our culture in some very interesting and dynamic ways. We have become used to yearly cycles of, <clears throat> of replacing things. Every year in September, a new iPhone comes out because it's the next great thing. Every fall, we have new TV shows because it's the next season. And in October, November, it's the new basketball, next basketball season. Football starts in the summer. Baseball starts in the spring. School starts in the fall. Everybody knows that we have now been conditioned, <clears throat> we have now been conditioned by culture to know that there is something next. We, now, what that creates in our bodies, in our minds, in our person, is this weird tension because everything around us is telling us next, next, next. But it causes this weird friction in our body because I know that when we have to face next situations in our lives, no matter how good they are, that's why people get nervous on their wedding day. That's why people cry when they see the baby. <coughs> Even though we've positioned ourselves to think that next is the greatest, the reality is, is that next creates tension in our psyche and in our body. 
And, you know, we live in Silicon Valley. We live in Silicon Valley. You know, we're supposed to be the most progressive of areas. Um, we're supposed to be. <laughs> and, and I serve on public commissions that we deal with policies and issues. And it always amazes me in the heart of innovation, in the heart of companies that change everything, in the heart of places that people work where everything always changes. Anytime we try to change something locally, positively, somebody says, you can't change my city. People act like a high-rise is going to destroy their town. It puzzles me. It puzzles me. We have, we have, a mid, we have Midwestern-style cities built in the, in the place of innovation because people don't want to change. We don't want to change what we've done. You know, people act as if change and next is a challenge. And I'm here to tell you, next is challenging. Because we, as human beings, we like the flow of life. We like how our life is going, and then something happens, and it messes us up, and it gives us discombobulation. And now we're going into next. It might be ordained by God. It might be what we need to do. But we're running back, and we're retreating because we were used to what we were doing. We vilify next. In some places, we vilify the past to justify next. Let me talk about that for a minute. Just because you're going into next, you don't have to vilify the past. It was good. You were there. Just because God is rearranging things around you doesn't mean that your past is broken or it should haunt you. It just means that you walked that way and you had some good times and God blessed it. Now you're going into something else. You know, one of the things I hate to see is people vilify something to justify the next move. Next is just next. It's just the passage of life. Nature works on the cycle of next. Let me explain. Um, you know, in January, if you are in from the Northeast or California before climate change, in the winter, you would experience rain and snow. But as the rain and snow puts moisture into the soil and puts snow onto the snow caps, it prepares for the spring, which is next. And in the spring, the showers and the rain allow beautiful flowers to bloom. And after the spring, we get into the warm summertime where the crops that we planted in the spring can now grow and become fertile because of the heat that was there and the water that was from the spring. And after we go through summer and we reap the crops, we go into the fall where we prepare the fields again for the winter rains so that we can come back and the cycle goes over again. God has designed nature for next, but it still is a problem for us. And it's all right. I'm here to tell you that God understands your apprehension about next. This quite simply here in the text. We are at an interesting place. We're at an interesting place. We're at an interesting place where, if you read your Bible, um, we see the trauma of the crucifixion. We see the disciples um, in the upper room breaking bread, you know, them telling people, you know, telling Jesus, we will never leave you, forsake you. Then they go run. They go to Garden of Gethsemane. The Romans come. They run. They hide. Jesus gets taken. And he goes through the whole resurrection. He goes through the whole process of going from Pontius Pilate, then moving uh, from Pontius Pilate to, uh, sorry, going to 
going to the high priest, then going to Pontius Pilate, then getting beaten, then walking down the Via Della Rosa. Um, then he gets crucified. And by the time he gets crucified, there's nobody there but the woman and, and, one, and, one, and, and one of his disciples, the one that he loved. And that's right there. They're just there. And then, and then, they spend three days, three days, three days, three days, and Jesus is resurrected. So now they have the joy of the resurrection. And it's great from a story perspective, but what if you're a disciple? Let me take a further step back. These disciples were minding their business, living their best life, living their best life. As fishermen, 50, 60, 70 miles north in the Galilee. They were fishing, they were doing what they always planned to do with their life. And then this man named Jesus came and said, Put that down and come follow me. Thank you. Put that down and come follow me. Follow me. Follow me. So they leave it, and of course they're a little nervous, but then they start following this man, and they follow Jesus for three years, and they get used to following Jesus. They get used to miracles and signs and wonders. They get used to the crowd. They get used to being in, in a circle. I mean, actually, Janet, they got a good situation. They're not ever going to go hungry if he could feed 5,000, 12 is easy. <laughs> You know, they they good now. They they in the center. They are so good, Lucilla, that they start arguing about who's gonna sit on his right hand. They got position, they got everything. And now, after all that, he gets crucified. So everything they thought, they were thought that this was going to be easy. Jesus was going to walk in. He's going to snap his fingers. Romans gone. High priest gone. Sit on the throne. We're right here. That was the plan. But he gets crucified. It's, tr it's so traumatic. They're running. They're hiding. They're hiding, in the, they're hiding in, the, in a room. It is traumatic to their spirit. Then Jesus comes back to life. And that's great for Jesus. But ain't no job security following around a man that came back to life. <laughs> His plan's good. <laughs> he can stand, right? <laughs> He's got a good plan. But what about us? What about us? You know, he comes back the first time, Thomas is not dead. Uh, um, Downton Thomas sees him and says, well, if you really come, uh, 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 the first time he comes back, Thomas is not in the room. They're all awed. Thomas comes back, I don't believe y'all. He says, I need to see for myself. Jesus comes back, walks into the room, the door was locked. He says, I need to touch your side in this. And they do all of that. And they now have experienced Jesus. But what does it do for them? And it leads to this point in the text where Peter says, I'm going fishing. It going back to what he did three years ago. And check this out, um, um, Kelsey. Um, the reality is this, is that you notice they don't say he tells them and they have a discussion. He says, I'm going fishing. And they said, let's go. <laughs> he didn't have to argue. He didn't have to do nothing else. They were like, because the next is gone for them. What they thought was going to be next is gone. They thought they were going to be. So now they have nothing but to go back. And there's three things I've, I, learned, I learned in reading this text. Um, and I'll give them to you. And then I'll explain them each. Next is scary. God will reveal himself in next. And 
and next will open new doors. Let's talk about next is scary. I think oftentimes when we preach, we preach, uh, we don't admit the human frailty in the situation. But I'm so glad the Bible's not a preacher. Because the Bible clearly shows that they were scared in the moment of next. I'm here to tell somebody today that the apprehension and the tension that you feel in yourself is natural. You're wondering what next is going to give you, what next will be, and it's bringing real tension to your life. Some of us want to return to what we used to do. Some of us are running to where we need to go. But anywhere you are, just like the disciples, next is scary. There's a real tension in that moment. Even if you planned it, it's still scary because you don't know what it's going to be. I don't blame the disciples. The disciples had a reaction just like any of us would. They said, let me go back to what I've always done. Let me go back to my certainty. Let me step back to where I need to go. Let me move there because at least I know if I go fishing, I catch some fish, I sell some fish, I'll be able to feed my family. I'm good. And many of us, when we're faced with next, we'll just go back to what we always did. Our habits, our proclivities, are things that will attract us. And that's, that's the part about being scared. Admitting you're scared but not running back to the things that will mess you up. I always tell people, I always tell people um, when dealing, like, I have friends. No, I have friends. I have friends. Um, they're a single and, and the one thing that our modern culture has really helped in singleness is that sometimes people main, date to maintain. <laughs> they know they ain't going nowhere. They know. They, they could call somebody and watch a Netflix movie and chill. That's what it's good for. They're not dating with any goal. They're not dating with any, um, with any destination in mind. They just dating to pass time because it's comfortable. It's not healthy. It's just comfortable. And how many of us are doing that with everything else in our life? We're going back to things that just make us comfortable, not things that will move us forward because it's scary It's scary to love somebody with all the heart and not just maintain. It's scary to trust somebody in you. It's scary to start over. It's scary, so I'm going to just sit right here and maintain because I'm good here. (laughs) They trifling, but I'm good. (laughs) I know exactly what they provide. I don't have to have no hopes. I ain't got no dreams. I could just maintain it. (laughs) Because if I go over there, I'm going to have to learn new things, be with new people, stretch myself, look at myself. (laughs) But I can stay right here. I'm good. (laughs) You see how scary next is? It's scary, and I need to t- tell that there's a first point. Usually they say you got to have something that you can make people shout and clap, and this, you're not going to clap. Uh, no, at the end of this point, we'll get there at the end of the sermon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I need us to be honest with ourselves. One of the things we've missed in the church, um, um, Reverend Tahina, is that we have missed the contemplative part of our faith. In the rush to get to the praise, we forget that there needs to be moments of contemplation about how we are and the situations we are processing. 
We live in a broken world. We are broken people interfacing with other broken people and other broken situations. And there's sometimes there needs to be a season of contemplation. Because if it's scary, why is it scaring me? Is it something inside of me? Is the situation dangerous? If we never contemplate, how do we process? Because let's be honest, next is scary. But we need to contemplate and spend time in that place. I know it's hard, it's hard, you know. It's, and, uh, you know, I was sharing um, with somebody that this week I had to take some time off. And, and the one thing I realized, I realized um, is if I stop to slow down, the world won't end. If I take some time out to process, the world won't end. Take your time, because next is scary. But this is the good news, the good news. God will reveal himself in next. God will reveal himself in the next thing. I have experienced that even though I might have fear, I might have doubt, I might have trepidation, I might have anxiety in the next season, God will reveal himself in the next. It might not be the way that he revealed himself in my past season. It might not be how he's always worked with me. But in that next season, he will find new ways to work with me and be with me. Check this out. Check this out. Um, um, they are now, they, they've decided, I'm going back fishing. They go in the boat. They can't catch fish on the other side. But Jesus comes to them at the shoreline and says, throw the net over to the other way. He never reveals in this point that he is God. There is no flash. There is no lighting. There's no miracle. It is almost in, in the next season, it was a small voice from the shore that God revealed himself at. He didn't call them in. He didn't tell them anything. He didn't tell them they were disciples. All he did was he called and said, throw it on the other side. Now, this is the part that blows my mind. They listened. When God is speaking, us, speaking to us in next, we need to let go of our excuses and start listening to the voice of God because God will reveal himself in next. Now, let me give you some notes parenthetically to insert right here. Um, they had to be attuned to the voice of God. That's why your personal time with God is so critical. That's why spending time and walking with believers is critical. Because you will hear, the problem is we hear so many voices today that deciphering what the voice of God is can be hard. Number two, you've got to be willing to listen and not make excuses. What didn't they say? They didn't say, we've been fishing all night. They didn't say, how do you know? <laughs> because Libra, check this out. When they first met Jesus, when he told them to do and switch on the side, they argued with him. This time, three years later, they were willing to listen to small voices because they had been with Jesus. And God starts revealing himself in the next. As you deal with transitions in your life, as you deal with the paradox of next, where you are standing in a place where you're scared, the only thing that can help you most time is the voice of God speaking to you. But you should not be so scared that you miss the voice of God because this is the thing. He cares for you more than enough that he will speak to you personally. will reveal himself in the next. God 
will start speaking to you in the next. I encourage you to wait for the voice of God in your season of next. Because it's not going to be like the last season. It'll be different in the next season. But that's God moving. You know, uh, my be- one of my best friends, um, best man in his wedding, uh, um, his daughter's my goddaughter. Uh, she's graduating um, college this year. <laughs> We're getting old. He celebrated his 45th birthday, so me and him on the phone, we talking like we're old men now. <laughs> we ain't that old, but we felt old yesterday, two, two and a half hours of talking. But he was so excited about, like, talking about the next season of his life and the travel and all the other stuff. And sometimes we just have to get a spirit in ourselves that we can see a beautiful thing on the next day. He's like, I had a great time raising my kids. I had a great time doing this. I had a great time doing that. I had a great time this and that. But now, me and my wife, we just booked a ticket to go to Cairo in May. Because she, the baby graduated in May, and they got on playing in May. <laughs> yeah, they ain't no pain with college. But, oh, oh, but... <laughs> But you see what I'm saying? He's like, he's visioning that new thing. So sometimes as you deal with next, you've got to be willing to, it's not going to be like the past, but there's some beautiful things in next. It shifts its very way. It's going to be different, but there's beauty there. Now let's go through the thing. Last point. I'm, all, I'm almost done. Next will open new doors. So, I throw the fish. They, they, they listen to the voice of God. And they throw the net on the other side of the boat. So they are committed to next. And all of a sudden, there's 153 fish in the net. Now, and Jesus tells them, come to the shore. And let's look what happens. Peter realizes it's God. This moment shifts Peter's very relationship with God. This moment changes Peter's relationship with Jesus. It's a new beginning and a new opening. And Peter, of course, he's impetuous. Uh, remember, Tahina, he, he, he puts on his good robe because he was working, so you had to put on the good robe. And, and this is, never makes sense. It's, it's, it's lake water. So lake water <laughs> is very silty and muddy. It's, it's a, he he should have kept the robe off. <laughs> If you have been to the Galilee, uh, right, Sister Iris, we went there. It, it, it ain't clear, crystal clear water. It's not crystal clear. <laughs> he puts on the good robe and jumps into the water and runs to Jesus. And this is the thing that blows my mind. Is Jesus told him to catch fish, and he gets to the water, gets to the edge, and Jesus has already prepared something for him. Listen, the text is very clear. It says, there was charcoal burning with bread and fish. He had made provision for him in the next. Because when he heard his voice, God opened doors for him. And he made a place for him. And he met him 
right there. What I'm trying to say to somebody right now is that God will meet you in your season of next. He is preparing a place for you at the side of the water that there will be, it's cooked and there will be bread and there will be fish and God will meet you right where you need to be met. Somebody right now is dealing with doubt, is dealing with fear, is dealing with anxiety, is dealing with brokenness. They're dealing with how do I deal with next? And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to figure it out because when God speaks, he will meet you right where you are, meet you right where you need to be, meet you right, right, right there. And when God meets you in the next, he is going to prepare a table for you. So I need somebody today that's dealing with stuff, that's dealing with situations that let you know that on the other side of next, on the other side of brokenness, on the other side of unplanned changes, on the other side of struggles and toil, on the other side of snares and issues. God is preparing a next for you. He said it in the Psalms. He said, I will prepare a table in front of your enemy. So if anybody's attacking you, don't worry about you. Don't worry about it. God is making a way out of no way. I need the believers and I need those that know God to know that when you go through something, God will open doors. God's next, there will be a door open. God's next will be a breakthrough. I don't know if there's anybody that's dealing with something today. But if you are, this message is for you. To let you know, as scary as next will be, that God will reveal himself there. You know, when I was younger, I had a thought of God, that God had to fix a situation. And what I realized was that God doesn't fix every situation. He walks with me through every situation. I got mad at God for a little bit. I said, God, why wouldn't you fix it? I, I want you to fix it. And what I realized was that by trusting God in those moments, when I got on the other side of next, I would see him in a new light, and he would bless me in new ways. You know, it's um, one of my favorite books in the Bible, Reverend Jordan's Book of Job. Um, well, for a, few, for a few reasons. The first is, um, it, it really shows me you can't listen to people. Because <laughs> all his friends were smart, and they told him all his brokenness was his fault. But God was clear, life happens. But at the end of the book, he never got back what he lost in the beginning of the book. But God gave him more than he expected at the end of the book. So you may never get it back, but what God is giving is going to be a blessing. Let's pray. Could we please stand? Please stand. Please stand. May we bow our heads, close our eyes. I want to ask the goods. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. But if you want me to pray for you right now about a next, just raise your hand. I'm not going to call a name. Amen. 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 All over the building. Amen. You may lower your hands. Father God, your children are in the season of next. They're dealing with the paradox of next. 
They're trying to figure out what to do next to God. And right now, I'm asking that you will sit heavy in their life, God. You will meet them in their midnight hours. You will speak to their hearts. You will speak to them in places that they feel lost. You will speak to them as they deal with the difficulties and the vicissitudes of life, God. God, reach in and first comfort them as they deal with the fear and the scaredness of next. God, meet them in new ways in this next. Meet them with love. Meet them with care. Meet them with provision, God. And God, at the end of it all, when you open the doors, they will see you in a new light, but they will know that they serve a miracle-working God that made a new way out of no way, that spoke to people in a new way, that worked it out in a new way as we go through next. In your holy name, amen. Amen.